Well, let me talk a little bit about the dish that we're preparing today. Uh, today we're making a dish from a seasoned cookbook. It's one of my absolute favorite spring dishes, even in the summer. What's great about this dish is that you can use any vegetables, whatever you essentially have around. So if you get garden boxes, or if you've got lots of things growing in your garden, like we have here at Kendall Jackson, then, um, then you can use any of that. So I gave a list of vegetables that we use in the recipe, but quite honestly, it's, it's just what you have. So this is an oil poached tuna dish. Are we good, Pedro? Do you guys get a good view right now? Um, it's a little blurry. Uh, Tommy is coming in through pretty good. Is that a little bit better? That seems, there we are. That, this one looks a lot better. Yes. You can see me? Yes. Okay, I wanna make sure that everyone gets to see all the good stuff. So, um, okay. So this is an olive oil poached tuna dish with a vegetable escabeche and white bean puree. So olive oil poached tuna is, I know it seems like a lot of olive oil, but this oil can get reused. So when we get to that part, we'll talk about that more, but I know right off the bat, it seems like an awful lot of olive oil, but it's so worth it. And then the vegetables, um, this is like a quick pickling of vegetables. This is the Spanish style uh, pickling of vegetables. It doesn't take a long amount of time. That's the point, but they pickle in just a few minutes. So, um, so you know, that's, that's what's great about this dish is that it can happen really fast. So. We're going good. We can see you. It's a little blurry, but we can see you and you're not reverbing as bad. So it's, it's excellent. Um, and, you know what, when we were talking about the oil that you're poaching it in, is there, do you need to be continually, is it, does it have to be virgin olive oil? Should you be using extra virgin olive oil? Or is there a grade of it that you need to be looking for? Yeah, you want to be using uh, virgin olive oil. You want a, a fairly good quality oil um, because you, it's important for flavor. So if you're using virgin olive oil, it's imparting that flavor. Now I'm tall. Okay, well, let's forward. Yeah, okay, a little bit back. Tilt the screen a little bit back, Tom. Just that, okay, perfect, let's just do, yeah, there we go. Okay. Perfect, okay. Um, so you want you want it to be a, a good quality, a decent quality oil. It doesn't have to be like a finishing olive oil. Don't, don't waste your money on that, but you want it to be a good oil because like I said, you're gonna reuse this. You can even use this oil, like sometimes when I make this dish, if there's a little bit of tuna left over, I'll make tuna salad the next day and I'll mix some of that tuna oil into it. And it's like the best tuna salad you've ever had in your life. Nice. So let's get cooking. So the first thing we want to do is get our vegetables going. So in this pot right here, we're going to make the escabeche vegetables. So I've got uh, my olive oil, my verjou, and a bay leaf. So verjou, just real quick. Uh, verjou is something we make at Kendall Jackson, but you can get it at most specialty stores. Think of it as a really mild vinegar. So it's got some acidity, but not quite so acidic that it's really in your face. Great for this kind of dish because, again, it has some nice acid, but it's not going to be overpowering. Now I've got all these beautiful vegetables that Tucker brought me. I've got some baby fennel, some radish, some carrots, these awesome turnips, first of the season squash, which look at those with the blossoms, is so cool. And then we have a vegetable called seltuse. I wanted to show you guys seltuse. This is seltuse, and when it grows in the ground, this grows underneath, and up top are these beautiful leaves. They almost look like romaine lettuce leaves. And this is um, an Asian vegetable, and it kind of tastes like a cross between celery and romaine, but a little bit nutty. It's unlike anything I have ever had as a chef before. And so this is so cool that Tucker grows these awesome vegetables for us. So the first thing we're going to do is prep our vegetables. Um, and we're going to prep them as we need them for what's going in the pot. So I've got my oil and my virgin heating up. And then I'm going to um, slice my onion and my garlic and my carrots. So just a really quick you know, a thin slice, the thinner you cut your vegetables, the quicker they're gonna cook. So I just do a nice thin slice on my garlic. And then I have a shallot here, but right now like um, you can get some really great spring onions um, or, you know, if you have a favorite onion, you know, go ahead and put that in there. You could even use scallions if you want. I like shallots because they're a little bit sweet. So, and as you can see, I'm just really, you know, I'm not, this still isn't about complete precision. Um, I don't want them to be too uneven because I want them to cook evenly, but I'm just using my knife. Hey Trace, we had a, a great question about, uh, is there a substitute that you can use for verjou? 
Um, I know yeah, it's a classically. I think that's a great question, Pedro. Yeah. So a substitute would for you would be vinegar, um, but I would maybe use a little bit less vinegar, and I would also use a mild vinegar, like um, a champagne vinegar, or even um, you know, like a tarragon vinegar would be great in this dish. So yeah, using vinegar would be fine. I've got these really cool yellow and orange carrots, and I decided to pull out the big guns for you guys today and use the mandolin. So I think that this is one of those tools that people have at their homes and then they either get afraid to use it or they just don't use it. And this is one of those tools that we use all the time in the kitchen. Now granted, we're using it often, so we're definitely more comfortable with it, but it's one of those tools that is really handy. It's just about using it with care. So I think this is great because mandolin will, you can adjust the thickness on a mandolin, so you can cut things thick or thin, but you can also, what happens is it lets it be really even. So you end up with these really nice, even grapes. I know I make it look easy. So I've got these two beautiful, I've got um, orange and yellow carrots that Tucker has in the garden. So I decided to use a little bit of each. So at this point, my oil and my verjus are definitely starting to just slightly bubble, um, which is great because this is where I want. That's the sign that it's ready for me to add some of these vegetables. So. Um, I'm going to add in so far what I have cut is my garlic, my shallots, and my carrots. So I'm going to go ahead and add that right to my pot. So Trace, you said you were just kind of cutting them a little, you know, here and there, not necessarily a certain size, but maybe a little thickness so they have some uniform with what yeah, they're I mean, doing? Yeah, we're talking maybe a quarter of an inch. We don't want these vegetables to be soggy. We, so we want them to still have a bit of texture. Right. Um, so when you add them into the pot, I, they, you know, once I add these vegetables in the pot, they're not going to be submerged in that oil and vinegar. The, the vegetables are going to release a little bit of their own liquid. Be sure to add a little bit of salt. The vegetables are going to add a little bit of their own, um, release some of their own liquid. So then all of a sudden you're going to find by the end of this, it's actually a pretty juicy concoction, which is great because that essentially becomes your sauce. Um, so I've got my onion, garlic, carrot. I'm going to shave my fennel as well. I've got this beautiful baby fennel. I'm going to do that on my mandolin. And I'm just going straight down. This fennel is pretty small, so I'm just not even going to cut it in half. Oftentimes fennel from the grocery store can be pretty big. So if you have a big fennel, you can cut it in half or even quarters. And, um, and that way you end up with pieces that are about, you know, my pieces are about yay big. So that's, you know, that's not too big. I do have to stress, if you are using the mandolin, please try to use it for your first time with the guard. Tracy is an absolute pro in the kitchen and makes that look super, super easy. Uh, but the first time I used one of those things, I took a big chunk out of my knuckle for sure. So um, they do come with a little plastic guard on them. Um, they do. And, and, you know, when you're a pro chef, it's not so much a problem. It's like, you know, like writing, it's like a writing utensil. But um, they are pretty, um, a little, they can be a they, little bit they, harsh. Like I said, they can be one of those scary tools. But like I said, also, the more you use it and the more comfortable you get with it, it's like a knife. You use the prop. You figure out the proper way to use it, and then you're more comfortable, and then it can be pretty safe. So, celtus. I'm going to cut a piece off the celtus, and then I'm going to just peel it. That outside part of the celtus. If you could find this at probably even at a farmer's market, um, it's so worth it. So I'm just going to peel it. Um, hey, Trace, real quick, when you're talking about the shell, t the shell tooths and the shallots are kind of similar. I mean, the shallots are a little more of an onion, but are you using the shallots instead of the pearl onions in the recipe, or? I do use shallots instead of pearl onions just because I think they're really sweet. And um, so I, we, didn't, we, didn't have, we don't have any spring onions growing in the, in the garden, but we have shallots. And so I wanted to use something that one we have. And like I said, that's a big part of this dish is you don't have to go out of your way to buy every single thing that's on this ingredient list. You can maybe make this out of four of the vegetables and just bulk up the amount that you are making. Um, but shallots are just a little bit sweeter. I wouldn't really use a white or a red onion unless that's your only option. So I've got my vegetables cooking a little bit here. So I want to just remind everyone, in my pot, I've got my oil, my verjus, my bay leaf, and I've got my fennel, my carrots, my onion, and my garlic. And I mean, I, I wish I wish there was a way you could smell this right now, Pedro. <laughs> it smells so good. It smells so good already. It's like it's becoming fragrant. And, you know, it's just bubbling a little bit. Like I said, I don't want these vegetables to be cooked. 
I'm just lightly, I'm lightly cooking them. I don't want them to be soft. I want them to still have texture. So that's what I'm keeping an eye on here, making sure that I'm moderating my temperature. It's not on high heat, but I'm making sure that those vegetables are just slowly cooking. Really what they're doing is taking on some of that flavor of the oil and the verjus. And then, uh, and then what we're gonna do is, I'm gonna have the other vegetables ready because the other vegetables, the radish, the squash, these are so, these cook so fast that I'm just gonna have them set aside and we're gonna even add that off the heat. So once these, these the, the vegetables that are hardier, like the fennel and the carrots and the onions that you want a little bit of cooking are the ones that you have on the heat and then the rest, we're just gonna add those after this is done cooking. So they still have not only that bright flavor, but also color, right? Nobody wants mushy, you know, zucchini. And, so you want all that, that brightness to remain. Now, if you're cooking along, what I want you all to have getting ready is your oil for your tuna. So go ahead and take a second. Take a second to do two things. First and most important, have a sip of wine. Everybody take a break and have a sip of wine. Right? Happy Wednesday. Mm. Delicious. Now go ahead and put your um, four cups of olive oil in a pot with bay leaf and thyme sprigs. And you're going to slowly put that on low temperature, and we're going to bring that up to about 200 degrees. Um, uh, while we're, and then we'll let that heat up while we're finishing cutting the rest of the vegetables. So I've got these beautiful radish from Tucker. I don't know where Pedro went. Apparently, my screen is kind of taking um, over in some instances, depending upon what's going on. So we're trying to alleviate me from there. But I am here indeed, Tracy, and I'll pop okay. back in. Okay, Pedro. I got lonely for a second. Oh, no, you're not alone. And okay. Tommy's there, too. We are still getting a little bit of echo. So uh, maybe if Tommy can uh, move the camera a little bit closer, I think it might be able to pick you up a little more. Um, and then maybe tilt it downward you know, a little bit. The echo is possibly because... We were, we, are, we were working a lot in the kitchen today, and so the fans are on. And unfortunately, we don't have a lot of control over that. They automatically go on. So I'm wondering if the echo has to do with the fans. Okay, there we are. So we'll try, we'll, yeah. we'll do the best with it, and maybe we'll get a this microphone the, for the next one. The trials, of, the trials and tribulations of, of being in the kitchen. So I've now my radish, my squash, my saltus. I know the recipe says beans. We didn't have any beans, so I decided to leave those out today. And then I've got my oregano that I'm just gonna have at the ready. Again, I'm gonna add this kind of right before we plate. So you have the fresh, you know, the freshness of the flavor of the oregano. That's when we're also gonna add lemon zest. But I'm gonna have it ready here. Now, my oil is starting to heat up. So here's what I'm gonna do. I have a lemon that I'm gonna zest. Um, a little bit later to go into the vegetables, but we're going to cut about half that lemon into really thin circles. They don't have to be perfect circles because what they're going to do is we're going to put them on the bottom of the pot with the oil. And this is one of those tricks, not only does it impart a tiny bit of flavor, but what it's going to do is it's going to create a barrier between the bottom of your pot and the tuna. So that way your tuna doesn't stick to the bottom of your pot. It's a little chef trick there. So, if anyone's cooking along, I want to make sure they, if they have any questions, to go ahead and jump in at any time. So, well, one comment we do have is, you know, people can't see too, too well what you're doing. So, yeah, that would be great if you could hold yeah, it up a little so bit closer. Yeah, that's my vegetables. And I'm going to, I can already see, there's, I, they're not wilty, but I can see that the fennel is like just starting to wilt a tiny bit. And you can see that the shallot and the garlic, it's really the shallot and the garlic are the parts that you're looking for it to cook. You don't want this to have raw shallot or raw garlic flavor, but those, because they're the smallest things in here, are naturally gonna cook. But yeah, I could tell this, this is coming along great. And um, so I'm gonna turn that, I turned the heat off on that. So now um, I'm going to go ahead and add in my squash and my radish. And you can add in the radish right now, or you can wait till the end. That completely depends on your own uh, personal taste of how you like radish. I love my radish a little bit cooked. And um, so I'm gonna go ahead and add it in right now. If you'd like your radish to be really fresh and peppery, you could wait and add it in 
with the um, with the lemon and the cell too. So that's completely up to you. So I added these ingredients in, and I'm just going to give it a quick stir. So Trace, you just kind of quartered those radishes. Is that what you did? Yeah, I just sliced them the same as everything else. Everything I just kind of sliced. And like I said, the the size of how you slice everything only matters per ingredient. So for example, you know, my slices of cell juice, those are all the same size slice. My slices of carrot were all the same thickness. My, my squash was thicker than my carrot. But just each vegetable is cut, um, each individual vegetable is cut in its own uniform way because then those vegetables cook uniform. So I'm gonna pull this up because I want you to see like, already how beautiful this dish is coming along. Can you get Tommy to move it a little bit closer to the screen so that way he can, or is he there to help you out for a second? That's the one thing is people can't see it too, too well. Tommy to the rescue. Can you move the screen a little closer, Tommy? So just for a second so they can do a close up of what is in my pot. Thank you so much. Tommy is always rescuing. Look at that. Nice. And he can turn it down. We could probably see a lot better about what you're cooking and doing. That's a much better view, I think, if we could Well, he's, he's, that's, it's, unfortunately, he's just holding it there, Pedro. Okay. <laughs> the other way, it's on, it's on boxes. So, <laughs> unless Tommy stands there and holds it. I can try. You can turn up. And then, so now I've got my, my oil is ready to go. Um, so now is when we're going to add our tuna. Now, I've got these beautiful tuna fillets these tuna steaks, and they're about an inch thick. Um, so Tracy, the oil's ready to go because is it slightly bubbling, or are we looking at a temperature? Or? It's not even really bubbling, but it's at 200 degrees. So I did check it with a thermometer. I got this cool, you know, this cool thermometer. And, um, you know, you want to check it. You want it to be about, about 200 degrees. So I'm going to go ahead and add that tuna right into the oil. And what will happen is it should be submerged in the oil. Well, those are some beautiful pieces of tuna. Wow, the color. Gorgeous. Like just stunning, yeah. Right. And you're using Myra lemon in that oil, is that correct? What's that, Pedro? Were you using Meyer lemon in that oil? No, this is regular. It's just regular lemons. It's not Meyer lemon season anymore. I mean, the tree in front of my house, there's still some lemons on there, but for the most part, it's not Meyer lemon. All right. Myers, Myers would be fine with this, though, right? What's that? Myers would be totally fine with this, though, correct? Yeah. So, I've got my tuna, and you'll see instantly that tuna will start, you know, turning opaque on the outside. We're going to let this tuna cook now. The, the amount of time you cook your tuna is really going to depend on the size of your piece of tuna and the thickness. And that's just going to depend on what you're able to get from your um, from your fish mulder or from, you know, your local store. I was able to get these really beautiful pieces of tuna, so they're a nice, like, inch thickness. Um, there are times where I've had this where, you know, sometimes tuna is just a little bit uneven or it's not, you know, you can't get a beautiful piece like that, which is fine, especially for this dish, because once it comes out, we're going to, you know, break that apart a little bit. But you just want to be sure that you cook this really, you know, we're cooking it gently. So the oil is just barely bubbling. I mean, we're talking like tiny, tiny bubbles. And we're going to cook this until it is, let me, um, you know, it's going to be like translucent in the center. So I don't want to give you a temperature because it's going to be different, but you're going to cook this either to what I tell you translucent or what you're liking is. So if you want your tuna to be cooked all the way through, then you're going to let it cook all the way through. If you want your tuna to be more rare, then you're going to let it be rare. It's completely how, whatever your desire is. And any tips, like say someone's doing this with maybe halibut or uh, another fish, any yeah. sort of like, um, it, are there some go-to fishes that might be good, like tilapia or maybe some stay away from fishes with this? I wouldn't do this with a thin fish like tilapia. I think halibut is really great olive oil poached. Um, a very classic way of doing halibut is actually milk poached, which is interesting. Um, I think that you want to do this with a heartier fish. Um, and you don't also want to, like, I wouldn't do this with salmon because it's an oily fish, so it's kind of redundant, honestly. It's kind of like oil upon oil. But, you know, tuna is meaty, but unless you get the belly, it's not, it's not, it's not quite as fatty. I mean, it is. It's texture-wise, it is. But now, if you can get tuna belly for this dish, 
oh my god you're gonna be blown away we've done i've done this before with just straight tuna belly which is like the fattiest like best part of the tuna and it is so decadent it's crazy how amazingly decadent this dish can be with tuna belly um, so we got a great question with a bit of a heartier fish and we've got a question that kind of goes along with what you're talking about right now where uh one of our one of our people has a question that says, "We I only have a one pound piece of tuna. How should I cut it up?" Repeat the question, please, Pedro. It says, "I only have a one pound tuna in one piece, just a one pound piece of tuna, as like a large fillet." It sounds okay, like. How so should I cut it up? Off as, I get it. okay. Mine started off as a one pound piece as well. So you're going to cut it into even thick, as, as even thick portions as you can. The so, other you could do, I mean, one pound is, you could put the entire, depending on the shape of that pound, you could put the entire pound in the oil. Um, it's going to take longer to cook. And then you could kind of flake it and cut it from there afterwards. But I would just cut it into as close to uniform pieces as possible. That's the thing about tuna, right, is that it's never going to be the exact, there. it's never going to be the same shape every time. Well, that's kind of the thing like you had, you were talking about, like with the vegetables, you've got to look at how much evaporation is going to happen with it or uh, I that this piece is going to be a little longer, this piece is going to be a little quicker and yeah. kind of eyeball the tuna in the same way, much like cooking uh, chicken. Exactly, rice. yeah. I mean, it's just a gauge and um, yeah, it's just a gauge, unfortunately. So my tuna's close to being done, so I'm going to finish off my vegetables. So I've got my, uh, my oregano and my lemon zest. I'm going to chop my fresh oregano, give it a quick chop. And I'm going to add that into my vegetables. And then I'm going to do some fresh lemon zest right in there as well. Yeah, it's going to give it some nice brightness, a nice, you know, finish. Make sure as well when you're zesting the lemon to, as Tracy's doing it, moving it around continually, you don't want the pith or the white part in there. That'll extrude a lot more bitterness into what you're trying to do. Exactly. Excellent point, Pedro. And I'm going to go ahead and add that saltus right now, too. Excellent point. So, yeah, you want to be cautious that you don't go down to the pit. At this point, I'm going to take the bay leaf out of my um, my vegetable mixture. And then I'm going to ask Tommy to do an assist. Tommy, you can just grab the pot. and put it, You just grab the pot. from It's not a hot hand. And go so they can see. So that's what's happened after I've added all my, my oregano, my lemon zest. You know, it looks really good, and the vegetables are still looking super crisp. You can tell that the water's kind of come out of exactly. them some, but you haven't added anything else, and you're stirring it here and there, and you're not kind of breaking them apart, I think, is part of the no. key, right? And that's exactly the point of this dish, Pedro. This is a perfect, like, summer, you know, um, springtime, summertime dish, because it is, it's, it's still, it's fresh and light and, um, and using up, you know, all the vegetables of the season, but it's not super rich and heavy. Now what is, I'm going to go, I'm going to take my tuna out. So that was about what, maybe four minutes, maybe five yeah, minutes? that was probably four minutes. And the other thing that'll happen is it will carry over. So, so you want to be cautious of that as well. Or I don't want to say cautious, but aware. Be aware of the fact that your tuna, right, my tuna is now out of this oil, but it's still going to continue cooking. So I like to remove the tuna from the oil say like one step before it's where I want it to be. Because by the time I get everything else set up, that tuna is going to continue cooking. Okay. All right, so now it's just a matter of putting it all together. So I've got my white bean puree, and I know I asked um, everyone that was deciding to cook to make the white bean puree ahead of time because obviously it's pureed um, beans. But I want to talk a little bit about it because I don't want to dismiss this part of the dish because it's a really important part of the dish, partly because I'm a big fan of beans. I love beans, everyone in my family loves beans. We eat it on toast, we, <laughs> we eat it for breakfast, we eat it at pureed, and so beans are one of those great ingredients that are inexpensive, but you can actually add a lot of flavor and texture to a dish. And in this dish in particular, the beans are adding this richness. Because you've got this bright, you know, this bright vegetable, the tuna, which is gonna be a little bit rich from the olive oil, but it's still meaty, hearty. And so this nice richness on the dish. And again, there's no real sauce. The vegetables are kind of like your sauce. It's almost thinking of it like a salsa. But this becomes something really creamy. And then adding a whole nother texture to the dish as well. So these are white beans, and I finished them off with some uh, creme fraiche or sour cream, just to give it a, that bright tanginess, but again, just more of that richness. 
So when I eat this dish, I go ahead and put my white beans down on the plate, just a nice pool of it. Because the other thing that's going to happen is once you put all the rest on top of it, it's going to settle and the beans are going to help hold everything in place. Tracy, can you can you hold that up a little bit? Because right now it's just yeah. white on white. That's yeah, a little hard to see. it's white on white because it's white beans. So there's not much to see other than a pile of white beans on the plate. I'm curious. And are you, are you, you're not heating those beans up. They're going on there. No, cold, the beans correct? are room temperature. The puree is room temperature. Yeah, okay. I mean, the dish, quite honestly, is not, you can eat it hot. Like once, you know, if we put it all together and eat it right now, it's definitely going to be warm and hot. But this is one of those dishes that room temperature is where it's at. This is al fresco right here. Um, so... The other thing about the other thing now, if you don't want to make beans, if you're like, ah, eh, this is, I'm doing, you can buy hummus or you can even buy, you know, you can buy bean puree and you can eat it as is if you have a favorite brand of something like hummus, that's fine. Or you can buy something like hummus from the grocery store and then doll it up yourself. So you can have half the work done for you. You need to take that hummus and you add some lemon oil and some sour cream or creme fraiche. So you kind of, you doll it up without having to do some of the work. This is a great dish, though. I think people don't realize how underrated it is. Uh, if yeah. you look at a lot of Spanish cuisine, this yes. this white beans is used across a many a tapa, and you could also use it in many other dishes just at home. Like you could use this to smear down and then hold a duck breast in place, or yeah. have veggies to put in place. This goes with multiple types of protein for sure. Yeah, and I'll tell you. Part of the reason that I included this recipe in the book is because there's a little bit leftover. And for me, this is great dipping, right? Tomorrow with this leftover bean puree, I'm dipping carrots or bell peppers in it. I'm again, I'm putting it on toast with maybe, you know, some chunks of avocado. Like this is, it's not just versatile for this dish. You can use this puree, um, you know, for a few days after. So I want to show you, I've got my tuna and I want to show you, Tommy, will you just do a little pull forward? I just broke my piece of tuna in half. I wasn't specific about it. I'm just... So I want to show you, right? My tuna is still just slightly pink in the center. I like to call it opaque. It's almost cooked, but it's more, I think of a medium rare. If you take this tuna, will you tilt down a little bit so you can see, thank you. So you can plate this however you want. You can take it just in these two chunks. I like to kind of break it up into a few chunks on the plate, like so. And then it's really important to season your tuna at this point. Right? Get some nice salt. You can season it right as it comes out of the oil, but season it with salt. And then we're going to garnish it with these beautiful vegetables right on top. Hey, Trace, we had a quick question about the beans and the consistency or the texture of what that is. And one gentleman or one person was saying that they, uh, they used a couple of cans of beans and it was still very thin. I mean, this isn't thick like, like, pa like pancake batter, but it's uh, a little runnier, I would say. How would you describe it? Yeah, it is a little bit runnier. I mean, you can see here, I'll, I'll show you like mine. Can you see that? Is there a glare? There's a glare. Kind of hold it a little sideways, maybe uh, against your black um, Hold on, apron. let me see if I do this. What if I turn that mic off? <laughs> no, it's okay. Um, I wonder if I, maybe like that? Um, yeah, that's a little better. I mean. Right? So you can see that, yeah, it's like a, it is like a really thick pancake batter. Okay. Um, if it was a little on the thin side, what would you recommend doing? Maybe less olive oil? Or? Adding more beans. <laughs> okay. And adding a few more beans and pureeing them. But um, if they use canned beans, so you can put it back, Tommy, sorry. Thank you. If you use canned beans, which, I, again, this is a great, like, that's a good option, too. If you use canned beans, you want to be sure and drain them. So maybe that's, if you're, so maybe if you use canned beans, maybe they weren't quite drained enough, and that will definitely add thinness to the puree. So maybe drain them and let them sit for a little bit. Let them evaporate. Yeah, drain them for, let them sit for about five minutes or so. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Perfect. So that's it, guys. I want to. What a beautiful. Coming around. Coming around. And, and, you know, I know we've been answering some questions and answers as we've gone along, but if we have more questions about any of the procedures or the steps, now is a great time to um, chime in. Oh, there we are. Right? Here, I'm going to tilt it down a little bit. Oh, uh, that, yeah, much better. Right? Ta-da! Ta-da! Perfect summertime right? dish. It, it really is. Like, this is, this is such a great summertime dish, springtime dish. And like I said, you know, this is, what was that? Maybe six, seven vegetables that I put in there. I could have made this four vegetables, whatever I had. I mean, this is, like I said, I know a lot of people are doing farm boxes more so um, now than ever before. And so... 
I know oftentimes what happens when you people get a farm box or garden box is that they may not know what to do with some of the ingredients. This is a great answer to that. Um, using this in addition, using whatever you know vegetables you have, just keeping in mind the vegetables that are hardier or harder need to be cooked or put in the beginning and then just gauge from there. Are there any ones that you would uh, maybe red flag ones, super aromatic vegetables or anything that you might wear, wear stay away from? You know, the from? only ones that I would red flag partly more so just because it colors like red beets. Like if I put red beets in here, it would just color everything. So although it would probably taste good, they could be a little bit strong too. Um, but I think it would just turn everything a pink hue, <laughs> which may not be as, you know, part of this dish is just so pretty, right? Like you've got all these beautiful colors involved and so if, you, if everything was the same color and it was all pink it wouldn't be quite as pretty but you can put green beans yellow wax beans you could put peas in here you could put fava beans in here um you know you could if it was really in the summer you could finish them with a, some halved you know cherry tomatoes in there i mean there's lots of there's there's a lot of opportunity here <laughs> Well, and one of the one of the common questions as well, often because not everyone has the, the amazing farm box that we are able to get from Tucker is Seltus. You know, for me, Seltus it texture and body wise kind of reminds me almost of like the uh, remember the water cress or the water what are the um, water chestnuts water chestnuts that you get yeah. and that yeah. kind of has a little bit of a, a texture and body to it like that. Uh, what yes, are some other substitutions that you would recommend? in lieu of that? Or is that just something that we have here that you recommend? It's something that, you know, I know we have here. I think that it's starting to be seen at um, different farmers markets. I wanted to include it today because I think it's really unique and I wanted the opportunity to um, potentially, you know, share with whoever has chosen to join us today and teach them something new. It's not an, it's not an essential part of this recipe at all. It's cool. <laughs> and if you can find it, this is a way to use it because I think that's another thing that happens. You go to the farmer's market, you see something you've never seen before. It looks cool, it looks exciting, you buy it, and then you're stumped and you don't know what to do with it. So I just thought this is a cool way to use this if you happen to come across it. But like I said, if not, it's no big deal. It's not an essential part of the dish. Do you think you could go, I mean, this, uh, this is a personal question for me. Do you think you could go like a little earthy with this maybe? I mean, you could make this kind of seasonal and do like a mushroom one later on in the year or things of that nature. Yeah, you or? could. I mean, you could ask about uh, mushrooms for sure. And this like, I'll tell you, in the cookbook, we paired this with a, um, an unoaked Chardonnay. Um, I chose to pair it with Sauvignon Blanc today, partly because I was really craving Sauvignon Blanc. <laughs> um, but it's one of those dishes that's versatile that way. But I think you're right. Like, you can, you can morph this a little bit to season. You can morph it a little bit to what you're drinking. So, yes, if it were fall and you could do this with mushrooms and even, like, really thinly sliced butternut squash, it would take a little bit longer to cook. But you could, yes, you could definitely do that. You wouldn't have the same brightness. You probably wouldn't want to finish it with, with the lemon zest the same way. You could make adjustments. The oregano would still be great with it. Um, you know, but you definitely wouldn't have things like the summer the squash and you know spring garlic and some of those ingredients. But I think that yeah, I mean like I like I said at the beginning, part of this dish is the fun of the of the fact that you can use what you have on hand. One other one more Seltus question that we have that came in. Now yeah. that they have some Seltus, what are some other uses that they could use with oh. it? Or what are other things that you find that you've okay. used it with? I love it with melon. If you make a salad with shaved Seltus and honeydew melon and chop a little bit of cilantro and um, some fresh avocado. It is so good. It's like, it's cause it's like sweet and nutty and creamy. It's one of my favorite summer dishes. Oh, that sounds delicious. You know, I've had it yeah. before and what I would use sometimes would do a little bit of verjou and some, um, uh, I would squeeze oranges and the verjou together, almost like a huh? salad dressing. Kind of yeah. like you would use it like jicama, how you would use jicama as yes. well in a lightweight yeah. way. You could do it that way for sure. Definitely. So another way for Seltus is um, one of my favorite things in the summer is that very classic, um, you know, you find it at the, um, at the fair. <laughs> we have the fair. Well, not this year, but normally we have the fair here or you find it, but it's um, fresh fruit like watermelon and um, pineapple and mango. And then you, um, you put lime juice and hot sauce on it. Have you ever had that, Pedro? <laughs> yes, it's really, really good. It's really good. Seltus falls right in that category. Same thing, lime juice, a little bit of hot sauce, or tahine. If any of you know what tahine is, if you don't know what tahine is, go to your grocery store and find it. Tahine is, um, 
I don't even know how to describe it. Well, they talk the- about it as a lime infused salt, but I'd say it's yes, like exactly. lime and slight white chili, and it's, it's kind like of smoky it. and a little bit. It's a little bit tiny bit spicy, but really tangy. So yeah, it's a lime infused salt. But you often, at least for us here, you can find it in the produce section. Um, it is one of my most favorite and most used spices in my home. But try some of that on Celtus with some lime juice. Yeah. I, it's my favorite topping for margaritas. <laughs> yeah, mine too. Mine so too. Um, other wines that would go with this dish, I've got to say, you know, you said an un-oak chardonnay, uh-huh. but a lighter weight body chardonnay for sure. A viognier would be amazing. Yeah. You could I almost away- thought of Pinot Gris today too, potentially. I thought the Pinot Gris could be nice because it's also very like, it's a little, this dish is a little bit perfumey, right? Like with the oregano. And so I thought a, a Pinot Gris would even go well. Uh, Pinot Gris for sure. Um, you know, I think a, a slightly chilled, really light bodied Pinot Noir as well. Like our Nielsen Pinot, the Santa Barbara be. would be, would be pretty nice with that also. Rosé would also be delicious with you it. You took the words right out of my mouth. <laughs> uh, you know, it's amazing how much versatility Rosé can have with so yes. many dishes for sure. Uh, for sure. Yeah, it's pretty for amazing. Sure. Um, yeah. you know, you touched a little bit on saving some of those oils and saving mm-hmm. some of those dishes for a couple of days. Now yeah. you recommend like a, a, an airtight kind of situation. Yeah, so thank you for pulling me back to that because my mind got focused on rosé. <laughs> <And, laughs> um, yeah, so this oil, you, you, can, you can reuse this oil. So what you want to do is, because you've, right, you've now put four cups of olive oil in a pan. You don't want to just throw that out. You want to chill it, put it in an airtight container, and just store it in your fridge. So you can reuse it for the same dish. So hopefully you've all enjoyed this dish, those of you that have cooked along. Um, And so you're going to want to make it again. So you can reuse this oil a few times. And what you'll see is after, at some point, it'll start to almost look like it's breaking down. It'll look visibly different when it's cold. That'll take at least probably three, four, five times of cooking this dish. So that's how long. So that's, you know, if you reuse it and cook this dish four or five times, then it's, you've definitely gotten your worth out of that olive oil. Another thing you can use it for, like I said, is if there's any of this tuna left over, um, I, I make tuna salad with it the next day and kind of flake and pull that tuna apart. And using that oil to mix the tuna salad is super, it's delicious and flavorful. It's what your tuna was cooked in. It has that lemon and the thyme and the, um, and the uh, bay leaf. And so it's already full of flavor. So I use it for that as well. Nice. And the beans you could keep for, you said, up to about five days, five to seven yeah, days? Yeah, about three days. I would say about three, three days. days. Okay. Yeah, especially once you puree them with the stuff. Once you start adding the things to it, then um, not only in a day or two will they – what happens is they're never gonna, it's never going to taste as bright as it does today, right? So you make the beans or you make the escamash vegetables and it tastes really fresh and bright today. It's still going to taste good tomorrow. It's not going to look as pretty because it's vegetables that are in vinegar. So it's going to look a little bit drab in color. Still going to taste good. Same with the beans. You might have to liven them up a little bit with a squeeze of lemon juice or, um, but it'll be good for a few days. And like I said, if I'm just, sometimes when I'm cooking, I'm always, I'm always drinking a glass of wine, but sometimes I'm so hungry when I'm cooking that I need a snack. This is a perfect, like, little bowl of this with some, you know, baby carrots or something. And I'm snacking on that as I'm cooking that my real dinner. And um, you're just finishing it with a little bit of extra virgin olive oil, maybe some Malden salt and some just a lightweight couple things of that nature, correct? Uh, are you talking about the bean puree pitcher or the dish as a whole? Uh, the dish as a whole, I'm sorry. The dish as a whole does not need any extra oil because it's got all that, you know, all the Estabesh has has the oil and it's got all that in it. So as you put those vegetables on top of the tuna, it would be the same idea as if you were finishing with oil that's already on there. So um, yes, you can add a finishing salt if you want. Um, something crunchy would be great, like a Malden salt, a flake salt, or even like a, a celery, a gray salt, which has some nice crunch to it. Sounds good. And we have another question that says how long the oil will last, but I think we kind of addressed that. It's about four yeah. to five uses. You know, on the outside, you don't want to keep it longer than two weeks pretty much because the well, things that are in probably, it. If it's in your fridge and it's in an airtight container, it'll probably last more than two weeks. But like I said, you'll know. It's like if, if you, you know, it's like duck fat. Like if it's held properly in your fridge, it'll hold for a good amount of time. And it's oil. You just want to make sure you can even, a smart thing to do is put it in your fridge and let it chill. So it's, um, so it's a firmer surface and then put a piece of wax paper or parchment right on top of that before you put a lid on it. That'll even help it stay, um, stay even longer. That's a great suggestion, actually. Thank you for that one. That's a little yeah. chef insider for sure. Yeah, yeah. Any other, uh, we've had a couple other questions that pop up. I think we've answered everything. Is there anything coming in anymore? 
I guess it looks like we'll give it a couple more minutes, but we want to thank everybody who's tuned in and there's been a couple come and go and uh, we've had some great compliments. They compliments that said, you know, they didn't, um, they didn't believe how well the veggies turned out and how bright and light they are. And um, I don't know. We just want to thank everyone for showing up and being here. Um, We're going to be doing this uh, for the next four weeks. So there's going to be a couple more. Next, uh, next week is uh, chef Justin and he's going to be showing you all how to break down a whole salmon which is pretty fun. And he's going to be making one of my favorite sauces ever, which is called Green Goddess. A very classic, herby, springy, really, really great sauce with salmon. And for us, um, it's, it's wild salmon season. So this is a great year to be eating salmon and to be cooking salmon. So that's next week. And then in two weeks, we've got Chef Robert Buttercup, who's come up. He's here. So I'm going to make him come take that mask off a second so they can see your beautiful face. Absolutely. All right, here's Robert. Here's Robert, Chef. Many of you know him as Chef, uh, Chef Buttercup, and he's, we're bringing him in the mix here, too. So we're going to have Robert make a dessert for you in two weeks, and you're making us, what is it, a strawberry, uh, strawberry? Strawberry vanilla sandwich cookie. Yes, a strawberry vanilla sandwich cookie. I mean, come on. Are, are these going to be recipes that are out of the cookbook as well? No, uh, Robert's recipe is not out of the cookbook, but the Green Goddess recipe is out of our cookbook, and the recipe today is also in our cookbook, so. All right, perfect. We've gotten a few compliments on the cookbook and what a great job you guys have done on it. It's really gone over well. Thank you so much. Um, Are you guys going to be working on another one in the near future, or? Oh, Pedro, come on. (laughs) It was a question that kind of came through, (laughs) so I'm just asking Um, you live. I'm asking you live. It was, we, I'm going to tell you, we had a tremendous amount of fun writing the cookbook, and it was a labor of love. We actually took took over a year to write the cookbook because we wanted to be true to uh, what we were representing. And so all the pictures in the cookbook are, most of those vegetables were actually grown in our garden. And so it took us a year because we really waited for each season to be able to represent the food the right way seasonally, hence the name of the book. So, so and the name of the book is Se- Season. season. <laughs> okay. So season, we, that a was year a of wine country, food, farming, family, and friends. So it's, um, I don't know when we'll next write a cookbook. We learned a lot and it was really, really great. And I would love to do it again. And, you know, we, none of us killed each other. So that's a good sign. Um, uh, you know, yeah, I think if we had the opportunity, we would definitely do a follow-up. Perfect. Yeah. Uh, yeah. looks like we're kind of, I mean, if any more, another round of a few more questions come in. Um, you know, we got a question that said, you know, can we uh, get a little heads up on what wine we might want to try next time before? Yeah, definitely. If- so we'll put that in. So I know now next week would be Chardonnay. Um, and then Robert, what wine? You had a wine picked with your dessert. Oh, Robert's debating. So we'll get back to you on the wine that he wants with the dessert. But we'll definitely include that in the email. Um, I love that. So you guys can have that wine ahead of time. And um, but you know, here's the moral of the story with wine. We love we love talking pairings, obviously, and we want to set you all up for success and having a great pairing. But um, we want you to also be happy. So uh, so you know, drink what makes you happy in the moment too. So. Um, so, you know, yeah, like today I was craving Sauvignon Blanc. Luckily it went with the dish too, but you know, if you wanted rosé or Pinot Noir today, go for it. And you know, it, it is a little subjective, subjective as well. You know, if we're, if we're doing, um, breaking down a salmon next week, I, I like Pinot Noir and salmon, but Chardonnay and Pinot Chardonnay goes with it very, very well. Also. Yeah, definitely with the green goddesses of, is more Chardonnay driven, but you're right. I mean, P, I mean, salmon goes delicious with Pinot Noir, especially if it's like grilled or, um, it's, it's really delicious, so. All right, I think we are uh, kind of coming to the end. I yeah. think we've answered most all of our questions. We're getting a lot of thank yous. Well, and and any of you out there, if you have any questions, you can follow up um, with an email to our wine club or, um, you know, send us messages. But I want to say thank you to everyone. Thank you for your patience for us figuring this out in the beginning. Um, I do well with a knife and fire, but computers are not my thing. So it's all a learning curve. <laughs> We, it, it came across really, really well. You're always a pro, Tracy. And uh, thank you to everybody uh, that joined in. And uh, we look forward to uh, helping you guys through another cooking lesson next week. Yeah, uh, stay safe. So and, stay safe and sheltered out there and uh, have a very great week. Take care. Thanks, Pedro. Cheers Thanks, Tracy. Cheers, everybody. Have a good night.